Hey, this is Jovan, and you're listening to the Littleton Church Podcast. This week's sermon is the fifth and final sermon in the Out of the Cave series on depression. It's entitled, We Need Each Other. It's taken from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 through 21. Stay tuned because I know this message will bless you and help you. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe to whatever platform you're listening this week on. And also, I want to invite you to join us this Sunday. I want to let you know that on the 29th, there's also a summer kickoff for our teens and children's families of youth and children. And so we want to invite you to come and join us. I want to see you in person. We want to see you online. But most importantly, we want to bless you. All right. This is this week's message. And at the Out of the Cave series, we need each other. All right, good morning, everyone. If you're a first-time guest, we're so happy that you're here. Uh, stick around with us and enjoy some fellowship after service with uh, Dick and Peggy Bulls and all their family. I got to make a correction. I'm the one that makes the script for the announcements, and I gave the wrong date to Melanie. That's why she was like, what's happening? Uh, the summer kickoff is next Sunday, okay? Next Sunday, the 29th, all right? Everybody's like, what's happening today? Uh, we didn't know about this today. That's why I didn't know, because it's not happening today. And if I don't correct you, then someone will injure me or something. I don't know. I'm just kidding. We're not a violent church. No one would injure me. All right. That was a bad joke. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, we are in our series. This is the fifth session. It's the last one in Out of the Cave. We're talking about depression and one of the things that I've been experiencing in this series is you giving feedback to other people and to us that you have been seeking help. You've been seeking help. You've been reaching out to other people. You've been finding new therapists. You have been more open about your mental illness and your struggles during this five weeks. And I believe that that is the Lord producing fruit in the word of God. That's the word of God being implanted in your heart and giving you courage and giving you strength. And it's the people of God opening up their hearts to you and saying, you need some help. Hey, I'm a trusted person. And so this has been a joy for me in this series. You may not know this, but the first problem mentioned in the Bible wasn't sin. It was isolation. That before Adam and Eve rebelled against God by eating the forbidden fruit, God recognized a problem shortly after he created man. Just one man. Everything God had created was good, but seeing his solitary image bearer, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So God created a female image bearer suitable to be Adam's companion. Aaron Carady, an associate professor in psychiatry and director of medical ethics uh, at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine, says this. He says, rising rates of suicide drug abuse, and depression can all be traced to increased social fragmentation. That since the 1980s, reported loneliness among adults in the U.S. increased from 20% to 40%. The recently retired Surgeon General announced last year that social isolation is a major public health crisis, on par with health, uh, heart disease and cancer. He noted that loneliness is associated with increased risk of heart disease, stroke, premature death, and violence. It works in a way comparable to smoking or obesity, increasing a whole host of other health risks and decreasing life expectancy. It's no accident that one of the most severe punishments we inflict on prisoners is solitary confinement, which is a condition that eventually leads to sensory disintegration and psychosis. It's not good for man to be alone. In this final week of this series, we we will continue to explore the life of Elijah, the prophet in 1 Kings 18 and 19. And Elijah experiences symptoms of, of depression, but exasperates those symptoms, those episodes, by isolating himself 
from everyone else. When the Lord comes to him, he finds Elijah alone in a cave. So to defeat depression or to rise out of the cave, to come out of our caves, we need each other more than ever. This, according to Chris Hodges in his book, Out of the Cave, um, preparing to preach this message and others like it can feel isolated. As a preacher, sometimes we go to the lonely place with the word of God, with with listening to God through our prayers, with meditating on God's word. Uh, It can feel isolated at times. So I chose to write the series of messages with three of my friends. So four preachers have been preaching in their congregations the same theme. Not the same messages, lest you fear that I just copied another preacher's words. But sharing the same resources. We, we met together for a few weeks prior to building the lessons. Then each week we've been on Zoom. It's my friend Carlos who lives in San Diego and preaches at the Luminous City Church. My friend Brock Polk that lives in Fort Worth and preaches at the Heritage Church. And then my friend Neil Reynolds who preaches in Tuscaloosa, Alabama at the University Church. And as we've been digging through this, some of our own stuff bubbles up in our conversation. So it's not just that we're talking about like resources or articles or commentary or the scripture. Like sometimes it just ventures into our own stuff and we spend a significant amount of time in it. And then we'll be like, hey, okay, we got to take some notes on what we're going to preach to our people. And sometimes what has happened is what we have discovered of our own stuff, we've shared with our own congregations. And so you may have heard me share some times in which I had experienced depression and what, how it affected me and some steps that I took to help to bring myself up out of the cave. I didn't just form that group of people for content. I formed it for community. Um, it, it's funny to me because I, I tell them, I was like, listen, like, I just gathered you guys up as an excuse for us to meet once a week, you know? Like, there's a lot of laughs and, and there's some silliness and and then we get really serious too. But I was like, man, we got, and one of my friends just like, hey, can we like do this every week? Can we do this every week? I know that this topic can be very heavy for me and for all of us. And so I, I think that we all need support from trusted friends and peers. Because when you're going through something heavy, it's important to remember that we need each other. Because depression is a signal that points to something deeper. And when everything about how you are feeling and experiencing the world sends you into isolation, choose to reconnect with each other. Would you agree to do that with me? To reconnect with each other. Let's stand at the reading of God's word. I'm going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verses 15 through 21. We're continuing the exploration of Elijah And so, if it's your first time here, help me out in reading God's Word. I'll read aloud the words that are in white. You read aloud the words that are in yellow. Everybody in agreement say amen. Amen. All right. This is the Word of God for the people of God. 1 Kings 19, beginning with verse 15. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Azael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Very good, church. And Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, he said. And then 
I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elijah left him, or Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. All right, thank you for reading God's word with me. If you believe in God's word, say, I trust in the word of God. All right, you may be seated. Thank you so much. So Elijah here in the story is coming out of the cave, and here is what God does as Elijah is coming out of the cave. God tells him this. He says, I've reserved 7,000 in Israel. You are not alone. You might think you're alone, but I have some people. It reminds me of the book of Acts in chapter 18 where the apostle Paul receives some strength. He's with, he's with Silas, he's with Timothy, he's with Titus in Corinth. And one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, he tells the apostle Paul. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you and no one is going to attack or harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. So what does that promise do to people? There are others out there. I've reserved many people. It gives them strength. They're able to take courage. Paul's able to stay in that city for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Because what God is communicating is you're not on your own. People will respond to your preaching. People will respond to the mission of God. There are people out there. I've reserved people to help you. Come on, somebody. I have people who will help you. Because the lie is no one cares. No one understands my situation. My problems are unique. No one's going to listen. And maybe taking it as so far as God won't listen. But the truth is there are people who will help. So in coming out of the cave, that's what God does. God gives him a promise. Maybe you've heard the illustration before that sometimes if you're a sports fan, I know preachers and sports illustrations, you might watch an old game. Sometimes I will watch an old Bulls playoff game with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, and I know they're going to win, but I still want to watch. It takes away some of the anxiety, so all I have is joy and the fulfillment of knowing that they're going to win the game. You know what I mean? And I think that's what God is doing for his people. I, here's, here's a word from the Lord for you. There are people who will help you. When I share my heart to people, they're not just going to dismiss me. The people of God aren't just going to minimize my feelings. The people of God aren't just going to make me feel bad about my situation. The people of God are going to help me. They're going to help me. But the enemy says, no one is going to to help you. Elijah, no one's going to help you. It's better that you die alone. That's the lie. And Elijah coming out of the cave, hears the word of the Lord. And so here's what Elijah does. Elijah seeks help. Elijah seeks help. We could use this story as a metaphor of the church being the first choice for Elijah. He goes and he seeks help. I think he's answering the question, what is my purpose, as we talked about maybe last week or two weeks ago. I can't remember my own sermons. Um, you can remind me. Where he seeks out his purpose in the Lord. That one of the things that we disconnect from when we're experiencing symptoms of depression is a lack of purpose and meaning and value. And so we seek purpose. And the Lord gives him a purpose. And then I think another question he's answering is, where do I belong? Like, who's my person? Who's my people? Who's someone who will help? Well, the Lord sends him to someone who will help. He sends him to Elisha. So Elijah, he sent to, and it says, Elijah went from there, or Elijah went from there and found Elisha, 
right? From the book Out of the Cave, there, there's a story of a professor, John, well, let's just call him John. I can't think of his name here, his last name. It's, it's hard to pronounce. Maybe he's Italian. Um, he's considered one of the world's leading experts on loneliness. And John shared his insight that human beings no longer have to band together in groups in order to survive. That in ancient times, survival depended on cooperating and collaborating with one another in order to build shelters or to protect against predators. Have you ever seen one of those videos where the Amish build a barn in one day? Right? It's incredible, right? Like there's nothing, and then there's this huge, massive barn. It's like 200 Amish people coming together to build this barn. Well, that's what I think of when I'm thinking of what John is saying, that the people come together, build shelters, protect against predators, and to hunt and gather food. And so John called this our superpower as a species, our ability to unite interdependently. But now we're all experiencing the fallout of disbanding. Some people say we've never been more connected, but yet never more alone, Right? We've got email, we've got text, we've got social media, but we're still incredibly lonely. It's a disbanding. It's living independently to the point of self-sufficiency. This has been a contributor to our depression. Dr. Sam Everington, a general practitioner working in a poor part of East London, um, even though Dr. Everington prescribed antidepressants for his patients suffering depression, he decided to try another approach, a support group. He he made this approach after noticing how lonely and isolated most of his patients were. He organized a support group that met twice weekly to help people battling depression and anxiety. At first, several participants had to overcome their social anxiety in order for them even to show up for the meetings. A woman named Lisa literally started throwing up because she was so anxious. But she ultimately found acceptance and comfort as others shared their own distress about being there. Eventually, group members decided they wanted a project so that they could do more than just talk about their depression. They decided to transform an undeveloped scrap of land behind the medical clinic into a landscaped garden. And none of them had much gardening experience, so they they had to do some research and talk with some expert at some nurseries. But soon the group came together as a united tribe of people, sharing in the creation of something new and beautiful. Lisa summed up the transformation by noting, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. And Dr. Everington's, at Dr. Everington's invitation, um, a journalist, Johan Hari, visited the lush garden that had formerly been developed into scrubland, or or, or formerly been undeveloped scrubland, excuse me. Uh, He was impressed by its beauty, but even more taken by the truth it reflected. So often when people feel down in this culture, we say, just be yourself. But Johan Hari realized, actually, what we should say to people is, don't be yourself. Be us, be we, be a part of a group. So Elijah, after leaving Horeb, he goes and finds Elisha. And what we see about Elijah is that he doesn't appear to be alone again. That when Elijah reaches out to Elijah, he goes up to him and throws his cloak around him. He doesn't appear to command him. He doesn't force him to. He gives Elisha a choice. And that's demonstrated by Elisha being able to go back and say goodbye to his parents. Elisha is given a choice. Elisha doesn't receive this word from the Lord. Elijah receives it and goes and anoints Elisha. He he puts his cloak on him. We, We get the term, he passes the mantle to him. This weathered cloak that signified him being a prophet, having the office of prophet. He, he then transfers. There's no special powers to it. It's not like Dr. Strange's coat or anything, if you've seen that movie. But he's, there's significance to it. I'm, I'm giving you not only this responsibility, but myself 
We're going to be together in this. It was a secession plan. We're going to walk alongside each other. I'm going to mentor you in this. And Elisha receives this passing of the mantle. It was a choice to partner with Elijah. So Elijah coming out of the cave, we've seen what God does and what Elijah does. But here's what Elisha does. Elisha chooses to help. He receives and he comes along the journey. See, the church is to be, and using this metaphor, is to be a first responder. That when somebody comes, we choose to receive and to help. That we need each other. That we need each other more than we realize. We need and value one another. And so then he sets out to follow Elijah and become his servant. And I think here's some things that we can learn from Elisha. Okay, just follow along with me. How can we be like Elisha? Well, whenever Elijah comes to him, I'm sure that there's a big story that he has for him. And Elisha has a non-judgmental presence. I would imagine that if Elijah shared with him about his experience, maybe being in a cave, how the Lord had witnessed to him, here he is now, and this is the word that he has for him. Here's the assignment that we have Uh, There may be some maybe distancing and stepping back and wondering, hey, why did you spend that time there? This is if they had this conversation about it, I understand. But a non-judgmental presence. Someone comes to you and says, I am really struggling. I've I've been thinking and my mind has been in dark places. I've been isolating myself. I've I've been thinking of harming myself or I, I, I just don't have the, la- I have the lack of motivation and energy. I'm not sleeping. All the symptoms that we talked about of someone who is experiencing depression. What they need from us is a non-judgmental presence. We don't need to put it on them. It's your fault or you lack faith or you have some sort of demon or something, right? But we're there for them. And then a non-anxious presence. So receiving that, you know, not... Not putting your anxiety back on them, but being a presence for them that's a peace-offering presence, right? And when Jesus comes, my peace I give you, receive my peace, right? And so we are to be that type of person that whenever somebody approaches us, we have a non-anxious presence towards their symptoms. And then a listening presence. Elijah listens to him. That we need to be people who practice the presence of of listening. We, we're, we're listening first. You know, sometimes as a preacher, I just want to give advice first. I just want to, somebody comes to me, I just want to start monologuing to them and telling them and what they can do and what you need to do. And, and I've told you before that when I received coaching, I had a coaching that was a non-directive coach and he would just ask questions and listen to me. And sometimes it was kind of annoying, but I did discover some deep truths about my work and about my calling when I was with this particular coach. That first and foremost, whenever I want to give my heart to someone of something that is hurting me, I just want them to what? Listen, right? Hey, I don't, just listen. So a listening presence, then a directional presence. I believe that he goes in the direction of uh, Elijah. I think that when people come to us seeking some help, that oftentimes we don't know what to do. Can we just agree, you know? Like, maybe I might be thinking inside of us, why are you coming to me with this? You know what I mean? That might be how you're initially responding. You're like, hold this together. This is a lot for me to hold for this person. I know when I talk with Carl Johnson, we talk about holding space for people. And that can be really difficult. Like, oh my gosh, why are they talking to me about this? But listen, maybe what they need from you is to connect them with one other person. Direct them in the right pathway. That, I, you heard me say that before. Like if you come to me and you're wanting some counseling, I'll say, hey, we got two shots at this. And after that, I want to direct you to somebody else who's a clinician or somebody else who can really help you with this. Does that make sense? Like we can direct to others. I see you doing that in here sometimes. I see you whenever a new person comes here, you may say, hey, this is a, a new person. This is Jovan or this is Joe. And hey, I want you to meet this person. We connect them with other people. Because what is most helpful for somebody to come out of the cave of depression is not a book on depression, right? But it's, it's people. It's relationships. 
That the, the success rate of somebody venturing out or being in recovery or when the symptoms reveal something deeper is there's a community of people who are helping them through that process. That's why I say we need each other in this. And you need someone and they need you. The story in Luke chapter 8 where Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him and they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. And someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. And he replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. You know, I believe Jesus is communicating to people is that family isn't determined by bloodlines. That my family are the people who choose to be with me. My family are the people who choose to take God's word and put it into practice. Like that's my, my family. Like you could choose to be family. You could choose. You could choose. And I believe Elijah, Elisha chooses here. Elijah chooses Elisha and Elisha chooses Elijah. And in Jesus' holy family, we see in a particular instance where Jesus needed some encouragement, I believe, as he ventures to the cross. We see it in the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. The word of God says that Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And the Lord spoke and said, this is my son whom I love and I am well pleased. He says that to him after his baptism. But here he adds one additional thing. He says, listen to him. In the presence of Elijah and Moses as they're all gleaming in resplendent light. God says, listen to him. And, and why would Elijah and Moses be there? Well, I think that Elijah's presence in some real sense is a demonstration of his willingness to minister to Jesus in a pivotal time of his life. To pass the mantles, so to speak. Moses and Elijah passing the mantle to Jesus. Listen, hear ye him. I don't think that that comes from a place that lacks context for Elijah. Elijah knows what this is like because he's done it before. We seek relationships. We're desperately in need of a place to belong. We're desperately in need of finding people who love us and that we can love back. And I believe that's why the church was created. For us. What was Sabbath created for? For us. For us. And so what makes church different? I think church, the gathered church the people of God are a place where you could seek relational depth that maybe is not offered in other places. Spiritual conversations that you can't have elsewhere or maybe you feel like you can't or the barriers are too high for you and directions for your life, I do believe that. And then most importantly, that the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that indwells each person. That's what makes it different. That's why we're the most equipped to help people with relational problems. We're the most equipped to do that because God has called us out and called us into a community of believers. Amen? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Somebody say amen this morning if you believe it. A community of people to fight spiritual battles with you, to fight emotional struggles with you, to carry the load for you. In fact, this is what the Apostle Paul says. It's like, if you bear one another's burdens, you thus fulfill the law of Christ. Like, we bear one another's burdens. We have our own to carry, but we also carry others. That's what the community of beloved community does for one another. It's what the church does. We carry the load. Look, we have a great group of people here. I believe that with all of my heart. We have a great group of people. Stop looking around and saying, no one is here. All right? Stop looking around. Look to Jesus and his followers. In Romans 12, and verse 5, the word of God says, So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, 
And we all belong to each other. We all need each other. Will you stand with me? I'm going to invite the worship team up and we're going to close out and worship up. But you can give your prayers and you can give your concerns to us. We want to receive them. We want to receive them and we want to steward them well. We want to take your loneliness and and give you a place, give you a person, give you a people. We want to take your experiences, your symptoms, your signals, and allow you to experience something deeper in your heart. We want you to experience healing. We want you to experience fulfillment. We want you to be able to be free to seek help and church people in here, everybody. We want to be people who receive someone who's seeking help. We want to choose to help them. Amen? That if someone's going to entrust themselves to this place, we need to be trustworthy people, right? So that we can together bear burdens and have a fullness, a a full experience of God, a a fullness of joy, and and help people to experience fullness that's found in community. Our, our, Our vision here is to to have all the life and power that comes from God. Why, why, why are we studying about mental health or depression? Because we want people to experience all the life and power that comes from God. And so we have to talk about this and be willing to share with one another. If, if all that happens through this series is that you choose to share with somebody else who can help you get help, then the Lord be praised. The Lord has won the victory in Jesus through this past five weeks. We're here for you. The shepherds are here. We want to receive your prayers. You could text your prayers. You could put them in the chat. We want to pray over you. But let me first bless you, and then we'll praise. Holy Father, we thank you so much for this group of people and all who are watching online. We thank you. Father, we pray, Lord, that you allow us, through your Son Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that we would seek help. And that, Lord, also as the body of Christ, we would receive and we would choose to help. Father, make this a safe place. Help us, Lord, to destigmatize depression in our churches, not only for this one, but the other churches who are preaching this message. And Lord, not only for this one, Lord, but for for Christians all throughout the world. Father, may we be a united group of people sharing the bond of Christ and the mission of God. May we give love to one another fully and completely, without judgment, but with care and concern. And Lord, may you redeem people. May you rescue us from the pits of depression. And may you lead us, Lord, into a life that's free of anxiety and full of peace through your son, Jesus, our Lord, we pray. And all together we say, amen.